Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, the two IMU sections, uh, 10 on partial differential equations and 18 on stochastic modeling and uh, sto stochastic and differential modeling. Uh, my name is Felix Otto. I'm from the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig. It's my great pleasure to introduce Ludwig Kohl. Ludwig Kohl is professor at the Courant Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Among others, he was awarded the uh, 2019 Clay Research Award and was Hadamas lecturer at the IHS uh, in 2020. Uh, Vladimir Kahl is an ex expert in fluid dynamics. Uh, he covers a broad range of subjects, in particular, the exciting intersection between inviscid and viscous models, like for instance, the study of uh, viscous boundary layers and their subtleties. Uh, he demonstrated that the method of convex integration can be exported from the inviscid to the viscous world by constructing an abundance of uh, weak solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations. But I think the subject of today will go in a slightly different direction. Namely, he will speak about formation and developments of singularities for the compressible Euler equation. Please. Thank you very much, Felix, for, for the kind introduction. And I also want to thank the colleagues at the IMU for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, everything I'm going to mention today is, is joint work with uh, Steve Schkoller at UC Davis. Uh, and many of these works are also joined uh, with Tristan Bachmaster, currently at the IAS, and with Theodore Drivas at Stony Brook. And the main result that I will present today is a joint work between all four of us. Before getting into the mathematics uh, of it, I just uh, found this interesting uh, doodle on, on Google celebrating uh, Ladezhenskaya's 97th birthday. And I thought it was interesting because uh, under her um, uh, icon, you see the Navier-Stokes equations. And Ladezhenskaya would have been 100 years old today. Um, and in, in, in this image, you see there's a viscosity, mu, which is positive for the Navier-Stokes equation. And that's relevant, of course, for uh, viscous hydrodynamics. But throughout this talk, we will focus on ideal gases. And in particular, viscosity does not play a leading order role here. So we will take mu zero. And the fundamental model uh, for ideal gases is actually older than the Navier-Stokes equation. These are the, the compressible Euler equations. And the compressible Euler equations simply are a manifestation of three um, macroscopic uh, laws of physics. Uh, they are the conservation of, of mass here, conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. And rho throughout this talk will denote the density of the fluid. U is the velocity of the fluid. P written here in, in red is the pressure. It's a scalar function. And capital E, which is also a scalar, is the total energy, which is exactly the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And of course, the system as written here, it, it has a very interesting feature. It's a conservation, it's in conservation law form. We have a time derivatives equal to divergence of, of fields. And, and that means that the system is already set up nicely to study weak solutions where this divergence is going to be uh, moved onto a test function. The system is complete uh, by the relation between the total energy and the, and the pressure. Now, <clears throat> if you are studying the system in the absence of singularities, so for uh, smooth solutions, then of course you can distribute the divergences here inside. In that case, historically, it's actually simpler to work not with the total energy as an unknown, but with the specific entropy, capital S. And the specific entropy then simply replaces the energy equation with this transport equation. Namely, that the specific entropy is simply transported by the fluid velocity. And the system is closed now by relating the pressure to the entropy, and we're using the usual gamma law of the gas. So gamma here, the adiabatic exponent is any number larger than one. That's the problem that we are interested in. And 
there's a beautiful paper of Eggers, Grava, Herada, and Pitten from 2018. And the, the introduction of the paper, I, I, I sampled it for this slide. So they're saying that well <clears throat> into the 19th century, meaning uh, the work of Riemann, it has been known that the equations of compressible gas dynamics form shocks. From smooth data, uh, the shock formation is associated with the gradual steepening and eventual overturning of the velocity and density profiles. And the shock is characterized as the point where the first slope or gradient becomes infinite. However, you know, and this is uh, 2018, the authors point out that relatively little emphasis has been placed on a description on how the shock is actually formed initially in the first place, starting from smooth initial data. And by this, they mean that a lot of um, work has been dedicated to the so-called Riemann problem, where, where you start with the shock already embedded in your, in your solution. But little emphasis has been placed on how do you go from a smooth object to the shock in the first place. And the expectation based on uh, asymptotics is that the solution nears this first point in space-time where a gradient is infinite is self-similar. But of course, the self-similar properties of the solution have not received much attention uh, as of 2018. And then after this point shock has formed, the expectation is that in the transversal direction, meaning in the direction of propagation of the shock, the size of the shock grows and it scales like the square root of time. So the goal of this talk is to basically give a mathematical um, framework and answer to, to, to this, to this um, picture painted by Eggers and collaborators. So, so we have two distinct problems. We have the problem of shock formation. So shock formation refers to the, the time interval T0 to T1, which I have uh, labeled here. T0 is the time at which the initial data is given. So we're given initial data for the velocity, density, and energy, or equivalently specific entropy. And from this data, if it's smooth, you have a classical HS energy estimate for S bigger than dimension over two plus one. And in particular, the symmetrizer method of Kato applies very nicely. And, and this allows you to define a, a maximal smooth solution in HS. And the solution will live up to a time T1. And that time T1, a gradient will become infinite. And this is the first time at which something bad happens. Now, I said it earlier that we are only interested in smooth initial data. And this is not because of uh, somehow a mathematical um, curiosity, so to say. Instead, the main motivation is that as it turns out, and this is part of our theorem, smooth initial data gives you the correct uniqueness class. And I, and I will make this precise later. Um, okay, so I wanna play you a video of the shock formation picture in multi-D. So let's see if this uh, works. So I have this video here, and this is how shock formation looks like in, in, in multiple space dimensions. So let me play this video again. Let me uh, try to pause it. So what is plotted here is the density profile at an initial time. It's smooth and it has a very large slope. And then we let Euler run for this density profile in 2D. And what happens is you see that the, 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 the shock steepens. And at this point at which the simulation stops, there is, uh, sorry, there is one point um, in the center of the image at which a, a slope has become infinite. And this is the so-called shock formation uh, picture. In one dimension, the picture I just showed you is, is more classical and you may have uh, taught it in, in, in an undergrad uh, or graduate uh, PDE course. And this is the classical picture you see drawn, for instance, for the Burkers equation in, in which you just have the, the characteristics uh, intersect at one point in space and time. And then further on, they can be continued, of course, and they intersect in this cusp like region, which is a C one third cusp. And within this uh, red region, the solution is multi-valued. But of course, if you do want to have a properly defined weak solution, all you have to do is introduce the rankine huguenot jump conditions. And these conditions will identify a unique uh, curve here, which is in, in my case uh, straight because I've chosen odd datum. And this curve represents the shock region. 
And this then permits to have a single value solution away from the shock. So this is the classical 1D picture somehow everybody understands. I just want to point out that this time, so this is by the way, time, and this is space. This point in time is where the first gradient becomes infinite. Okay. Now, what has been known rigorously about Euler, not about burgers? Um, quite a lot and not so much at the same time. There are works, classical works that go back to Riemann and then Lux for the P system and it has generalized by many others in which basically you have a comparison by uh, Riccati equations to the evolution of burgers and you deduce that a slope must become infinite in finite time. And of course, this was generalized to other types of proofs by contradiction for uh, three-dimensional waves by Fritz John, and then for the full Euler system in any space dimension by Tom Sidarius using a virial type identity. So th these um, are very powerful theorem in the sense that they tell you that as soon as something could go bad, it will go bad, but it doesn't tell you information. Uh, it, it doesn't tell you what actually will go bad, when it will go bad, how it will go bad. It doesn't give you information. Now, in one space dimension, because of the strong analogies to burgers, a bit more has been known. And there's a beautiful, often overlooked uh, PhD thesis of Marie Lebo in 94, which uh, again only studies the so-called P system, which models a two by two system of isentropic gas dynamics in one dimension. And it's a beautiful, it, it paints a pretty complete picture of the shock formation um, phenomenon. And it was then revisited in, in multi dimensions, but under radial symmetry. So still one dimension essentially by, by Yin. And the problem in, in, these, um, in these works that there's no geometry to deal with. Uh, the geometric devils, which actually are our main enemy are absent. Now, in an attempt to deal with these geometric devils, you have um, works based on a different perspective to the other equations, the perspective of quasi-linear wave equations. And this is a very suitable perspective if you're de dealing with irrotational and isentropic flow. So irrotational means vorticity is zero. Isentropic means entropy is zero. And in this setting, Christodoulou and Christodoulou and Miao have shown that from smooth data, you, you do have a constant time hypersurface which contains the first uh, gradient singularity and this gradient singularity is a shock, okay? So the picture up to the first uh, bad uh, time has been painted by, by these authors. However, as you will see later, these proofs don't really give you a classification of what happens at this first time. Instead, they give you a list of, you know, all the bad things that could happen and they lack stability. The irrotational um, aspect of, the, of these works has been somehow addressed by Locke and Speck uh, in 2018 and 2021, who have basically built on Christodoulou's framework to allow for small vorticity. Now, <clears throat> together with uh, Tristan and, and Steve, we have written a sequence of works in the, in the past couple of years in which we have somehow painted a full uh, picture of what happens in, in, in multi-D Euler shock formation. So basically we have shown that from this smooth initial datum, which you've seen in the, in the video, not only do you develop a first singularity, but the singularity is in fact asymptotically self-similar. It is generic, meaning it's stable under small perturbations. And it, it, we give a full description of the solution at this point at which the singularity happens. So basically we can compute the location of this point in space time. We can compute a geometry, so the direction along which the shock forms, the curvature of the shock front near that, um, near that point. And moreover, we are able to consider the full non-isentropic, fully vor uh, visc uh, with vorticity, so rotational dynamics, in, in which you have actually sound waves interacting with entropy waves to produce vorticity, even if you start with zero vorticity. And, and this was addressed in, in one of our works. And we're proving more, we're basically giving you, a, a, in a sense, a, a, a convergence as T goes to the first uh, singular time by modulated self-similar analysis 
to an element out of a 10 dimensional manifold of, of objects. Okay, so this paints the picture of shock formation up to this first time at which something bad happens. And generically, this something bad happens at a single point. Now, what happens in multi-D? In multi-D, so this you should view as the analogous picture to, to the one where you have characteristics crossing in, in the cusp in, in 1D that I've shown earlier. And in this case, you have surfaces foliated by, let's say, um, x2, and here you have x1, and here you have time. So you have these foliated surfaces on x1, and because of the compression wave, they intersect. And just like in 1D, they will intersect in a, in a cusp-like cone. So by that, I mean that if you take any slice in, in this plane, you will see this 1D cusp, and it's of course foliated smoothly um, in x2. And the point shock that we had considered with Steve and Tristan earlier denotes the evolution up to this point shock, so up to this time slice. And so does the uh, proof of Christodoulou and, and company. The understanding of the solution beyond this time is insofar open, uh, but together with uh, Steve Schkoller, we now have a preprint, which will be soon on the archive, in which we have a full description of the multidimensional uh, pre-shock. So basically we are proving that Euler does this literally as in this picture. And we are proving that you can go beyond this first time of the singularity. So we can go up to some later time slice. And in fact, we can go beyond the so-called maximal development. The maximal development is the complement of this cuspy cone. Okay, so this cuspy cone, the complement is the maximal development. Here is where the solution is as smooth as the data. As soon as you enter this cuspy cone, the solution could become multi-valued and, and you may have some, some difficulties. However, we, we show in our work that if you work in Lagrangian coordinates, all these foliations actually remain smooth, not up to the time at which they hit this cone, but up to the time they exit the cone. So they go through the maximal development and they keep on going until they exit the cone and they remain smooth in Lagrangian coordinates. So this, uh, this image of the full picture of the multi-D development beyond the maximal development is together with Steve and it will uh, be posted soon. But this is not what this talk is about. This talk is about formation and development. Really, this is the interesting picture. What happens after this time T1 at which, at which the shock has formed and we have the first uh, gradient singularity? And the expectation is that instantaneously, after you have this uh, cusp, instantaneously a shock forms and you have this entropy uh, producing shock wave emerging out of the point shock. And in fact, there's an old conjecture of Landau Lifshitz uh, that you can find, for instance, in their book. And they considered, they, they conjectured that in addition to, to the shock, other so-called weak singularities form. Um, of course, in order to even mention what happens after the, the first singularity, we're going to need two new things. These are going to be the rankin hugino jump conditions, which must be mentioned in the presence of singularities and the entropy condition in order to select a physically reasonable uh, solution. So let me show you a, a video of what happens in two dimensions. Again, I will show you a graph of the density. Okay, so <laughs> I do not know how to stop this video. Uh, okay, so we have, we are now doing a direct numerical simulation of 3D Euler, in fact, it's 3D Navier stoked with a small nonlinear viscosity and adaptive mesh. And we are starting from the location at which the shock develop uh, formation part has stopped. We have now a one point singularity. And now we let Euler run. And, and this is what happens. You see this surface at the, at the center of the image. This is the surface across which you have a jump forming. Let me play this video again. And in addition to this uh, obvious uh, jump, which, which is forming here, that's the shock. You see at the very top of, of the image, there's a little bit of uh, wrinkles in, in the surface of the density. And you may think that those are uh, numerical instabilities or something, but they are in fact not, they are uh, weak singularities. 
So what are weak singularities in the first place? So let's go back to Landa und Lifshitz to the book, uh, chapter 96. And basically they're saying that besides the classical uh, shocks, which are surface discontinuities, condimension one discontinuities, there could be other singularities emerging uh, in, along which the functions are not smooth. And these irregularities could be of various kinds. You could have uh, discontinuities of the pressure density or velocity, or you could have uh, their infinites have a jump, or in fact, higher derivatives of these quantities uh, could jump, all of which uh, are possible according to Landa and Lifshitz. And they, they coined these uh, singularities, which are not jump discontinuities, they call them a weak singularity, uh, discontinuities. And it turns out that even in one space dimension, um, the analysis of these weak discontinuities for the full Euler system was non-existent. So uh, we were actually curious why uh, this was so, but of course the big, big problem, we, the, the big program uh, we are working on is to address this so-called uh, holy grail problem in which you start from a smooth initial datum for velocity, uh, uh, density, and energy or entropy. And then you want to provide a full geometric description. And by that, I mean, not just the geometry, but the stability, the maximal regularity, the location of the first singularity that happens. And in fact, of the whole surface of singularities beyond the maximal development. And then you want to describe how uh, this co-dimension one shock emerges, how it propagates forward in time. And in addition, you want to know a full uh, propagation of singularity result, meaning you want to characterize all the weak and the strong singularities uh, which emerge from the point shock for all the uh, wave speeds present in the system. So this is somehow the, the, the big question. And we have, Together with, uh, with Steve, I have alluded to earlier, we have uh, now done the first part in which the formation is done. And for the development, we this is the main result that I want to talk about. We, we wanted to start with a proof of concept that we have the right idea to, uh, to go uh, after this uh, problem. So in order to talk about the development problem, I need to talk to you about the rankin hugino jump conditions and about entropy. So the rankin hugino jump conditions are nothing more, nothing less than saying that U, Rho, and E are weak solutions of Euler. It's not saying anything more uh, or anything less. So if you satisfy them, you're studying a weak solution of Euler. If you don't, you don't study a weak solution of Euler. And that's it. Now, in terms of phrasing them, I have chosen here to draw a so this X is in R uh, D. I have chosen to draw a cartoon in which we have a shock surface, capital S, parametrized as the level set zero of a function scripty S of T and X. And this shock surface is meant to be a smooth, well, maybe smooth, uh, co-dimension one uh, surface along which the normal velocity, so normal to the shock uh, surface itself, the density and the energy jump, but the tangential velocity, uh, so the, the velocity tangential to the shock actually remains continuous. And in particular, this uh, shock surface locally in spacetime um, uh, decomposes spacetime into two regions, uh, a region before the shock and a region after the shock, which we call the plus phase and the minus phase. And the orientation of normal vector we choose is the one of the propagation of the shock. So in our in this picture from plus to minus, and you will see me uh, writing a lot this symbol. This symbol simply refers to the jump across the shock from the minus phase to the plus phase, that is from the front of the shock to the back of the shock. And then the conservation of mass gives you one condition. Conservation of momentum gives you another one. And conservation of energy gives you a third rank in Hukino uh, jump condition. Now we have three equations, because remember for the velocity, only the normal one jumps. So for the velocity, uh, we only have one condition. 
we have three equations for how many unknowns? So one unknown, of course, is the shock speed, which is the time derivative of this function. And then we have these three fields in front and in the back of the shock. So these are six, so two times three, six unknowns. So we have six unknowns, seven unknowns, but we only have three equations. So in principle, you could imagine that there's an issue with the problem of determinism. But this problem of determinism is exactly um, resolved by mentioning the entropy condition. So let me now discuss the entropy condition. Um, for a physicist, the entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the entropy, which is uh, density times S, it must increase in the presence of a shock singularity. And that's that. So in our language, the specific entropy capital S, uh, due to our choice of normal vector, must have a positive jump. So the physical entropy condition in our language means that capital S has a positive jump from the minus phase to the plus phase. In mathematical terms, there's the so-called lax uh, geometric entropy conditions. And they're basically saying that you, <clears throat> they're automatically deduced from the fact that you have a negative mass flux across the shock. So these are saying that the, the speed in front of the shock in the normal direction is actually less than the shock speed. And then the, the speed in front of the shock in the normal direction is less than the uh, shock speed also. But you also have the geometric conditions, which says that the shock itself is subsonic relative to the state in front, uh, sorry, in, in front of the shock, uh, sorry. Yes, in front of the shock, and it's supersonic with respect to the uh, back state. So these three conditions, and by the way, here C denotes the speed of sound before and after the shock. These three conditions are the so-called lax geometric entropy conditions. And it turns out that in the setting we are uh, interested in, in which you have a weak shock, and of course, so a weak shock simply means that these jumps in uh, velo normal velocity, density, and energy are small. And of course they have to be small because they came from smooth data. So there's gonna be no jump at some point and then the jump is gonna be very tiny. So we are in a weak shock regime. These conditions are equivalent, meaning the condition that the entropy be becomes strictly positive and the lax uh, geometric entropy conditions, these are equivalent conditions. So there's no two notions after all. Okay, so having defined all these notions, we can now define what we mean by this regular shock solution. So there's, again, two evolutions. One, which is from T0 to T1. This is the evolution time on which the solution remains smooth. And in that case, there's nothing to define. A solution is a classical solution, okay? Everything holds in the sense of C1 functions. However, as soon as the shock has emerged at time T1, we need to really specify what we mean. And whenever we are talking about a solution, we will mean about a triple U, rho, and E, so velocity, density, and energy, which are a weak solution of Euler. We do not want to uh, have vacuum states present. The shock surface itself is a co-dimension one orientable hypersurface. Uh, away from the shock, all the fields are at least Lipschitz continuous. In fact, C1 is, is a relevant class. The normal velocity, density, and energy have jumps. And these jumps satisfy the rankin huguenot -Hugin jump conditions. And moreover, the entropy inequality is satisfied whether you want to talk about the lax geometric entropy condition or you want to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. They're the same, namely specific entropies produced at the shock. So whenever we will mention the notion of solution, we will mean this. Now, two remarks are in order concerning solutions or regular shock solutions. First of all, even if you start with isentropic data in which the entropy is identically a constant, for instance, zero, as soon as the shock forms, the entropy condition states that there must be a positive entropy jump. So as soon as you have a shock present, if you want to study a weak solution of Euler, you better allow for the non-isentropic system. The system simply cannot remain isentropic and at the same time remain a weak solution of Euler. 
So that's the, 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 the first uh, comment, that if you really want to study Euler with the singularity in it, you better study the full system, including the entropy condition. Second remark, when you start with irrotational flow up to the first singularity, you know, you, you can start with isentropic and irrotational flow and up to the first singularity, it will stay irrotational and isentropic. However, as soon as one singularity has emerged, we have just seen that the specific entropy becomes non-zero. What, what happens to the vorticity at that time? So instead of working with the vorticity, which is the curl of U, let me work with the specific vorticity, which is the curl of U divided by density. And the specific vorticity satisfies a beautiful equation. So in two dimensions, it is transport and force. In three dimensions, it's vector transport or Lie advection and force. Now, where's this force coming from? This force, so-called baroclinic torque term, is due to a misalignment of entropy gradients and pressure gradients, okay? So this misalignment of entropy gradients and, and pressure gradients causes a force on the vorticity. And because we have just seen that the entropy will become non-zero as soon as you have a shock, because of this term, the vorticity will also become non-zero as soon as you have a shock. So generically speaking, not only is entropy produced at the shock, but also vorticity. So from that perspective, if you really want to study a generic weak solution of Euler with a shock in it, not only do you have to allow for a non isentropic system, but you also must allow for the presence of vorticity. You cannot work, for instance, in radial symmetry. Okay, so with these remarks in mind, the, the, basically the goal we set out to was the following, let us solve the shock development problem in a setting which is non-isentropic, in a setting in which the vorticity is not zero, so it's order one, but where we can still uh, not fight all the geometric devils at the same time also. So this is more like a proof of concept. And in fact, if you go back to, to, to the literature and you check what is actually known about shock development, you will see that uh, nothing is known in the generality I just mentioned. So in particular, shock development was previously only considered for the P system, which is again, isentropic gas dynamics, which we know that does not produce a weak solution to Euler. It's a system one can study, of course, but it's not a weak solution for Euler. Uh, the non-isentropic system has been studied by Yin in, in, a, in a very nice work, which actually follows up on Lebeau's work. But this work is in radial symmetry, spherical symmetry. And as we have just seen, spherical symmetry means there's no vorticity, so it's really a 1D result. And you, you, you basically cannot study um, the irrotational setting, the, the generic shock formation problem. And <clears throat> the, the work of Christodoulou from 2019, there's the famous book of Christodoulou called Restricted Shock Development. Uh, the adjective restricted refers to the fact that Christodoulou also works in the setting of isentropic and irrotational flow. And because of that, Christodoulou does conserve mass as, as the shock is produced, but he does not conserve uh, momentum, nor does he conserve energy. And in particular, he does not study weak solutions of Euler. He studies a system which is equivalent to Euler away from singularities, but it, it's not a weak solution of Euler. So in the setting that we were after, not even uh, any somehow result was available. And as a showcase of our uh, analysis, again, we wanted a setting in which you have vorticity, you have entropy, and you can solve the shock development problem. And the simplest setting that we, we could find was the so-called uh, 2D Euler equations in azimuthal symmetry. Azimuthal symmetry simply refers to the fact that if you start with a solution, with an initial datum for Euler, in which the radial, so because we're in 2D, I will denote by R the polar uh, radial um, length and by theta the radial angle. If you start with a solution in which the velocity is linear in R times a function of the angle, the rescale sound speed sigma is a linear function of R and the entropy is just a function of theta, the symmetry is preserved by the flow. 
The vorticity in this case, because it refers to rotation, is not zero because these functions depend non-trivially on theta. Moreover, the entropy is not zero because it's present here. And in order to simplify the presentation, we have just chosen one adiabatic uh, uh, exponent gamma is equal to two, which is the shallow water equations. But of course, everything in this analysis works in the same way for any gamma larger than one. And the key to the analysis, as it turns out, is a linear combination of angular velocity and rescaled sound speed, which are the so-called Riemann variables. So W throughout my talk will refer to as the dominant. So this is the dominant Riemann variable. And Z is the so-called subdominant Riemann variable, meaning W will shock, but Z will remain smooth as it goes through the shock, or at least relatively smooth. So let me play you a video of what this azimuthal symmetry looks like, because again, it, it is a certain symmetry reduction. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So the motion happens in the theta direction, and you see the shock has formed, and now it's traveling according to the rankin hugino jump conditions in the, in the theta direction. And the R direction, I've just plotted here an annular region for R between one and two. And as in all my other plots, you are seeing the density of the fluid, okay? So this is what shock formation and development looks like in azimuthal symmetry. And do not be fooled by this image. There is motion in, in the radial direction. There is actually non-trivial motion in the radial direction. And the reason that it's easy to see that is that the radial, um, velocity u r is not equal to zero. It's a function of theta. And actually this function causes a bunch of annoying uh, trouble. Okay, so this is the setup. And what does Euler become in this azimuthal Riemann variable setting? So again, remember W is the linear, is, is the sum of angular velocity and rescaled sound speed. Z is the difference between angular velocity and rescaled sound speed. K is the entropy, and A is the radial velocity. And the system reduces to this four system of scalar equations in which you have transport terms on, on the left-hand side. The transport occurs, notice, with three different wave velocities. And you have nonlinearities on the right-hand side, the most annoying of which is this nonlinearity because it loses a gradient. And this is the baroclinic torque term, nothing else but that. It contains the gradient of the entropy. Okay, so the wave speeds in the absence of vacuum are actually ordered. The wave speed of the subdominant Riemann variable is the slowest speed in the system. The fluid velocity, lambda two, is the middle speed in the system. And the so-called fast wave speed is, the lam is lambda three, which is the characteristic along which the dominant Riemann variable travels. In particular, notice one feature. Oh, by the way, these numbers uh, are here because we have chosen gamma is two. If you choose any other gamma, the only thing that will change is these numbers will change. Okay, so that's it. <clears throat> notice, however, that if you start with isentropic flow, namely k is equal to zero, and if you start with a uh, vanishing second Riemann variable, then k will remain zero. And if k will remain zero, z will also remain zero. So this is actually preserved by the flow up to the shock. But at the shock, both of these quantities will become instantaneously not equal to zero. The analysis that we are doing is not depend on any way on this restriction. And in fact, uh, Isaac, who is a PhD student at Courant, has, has given a, a, a much more uh, elegant proof of this in the general case of non-trivial initial uh, entropy and subdominant Riemann variable. So let me go back to the issue of rankin huguenot jump conditions and determinism. In this azimuthal symmetry setting, we can, the shock is actually a location, an, uh, an angle theta, at which the shock lives as a function of time. So the parameterization we're giving of the shock surface 
is that theta is a function of time, okay? Now, you can go back to all our previous notations. Here we have the plus phase, here we have the minus phase. So why am I drawing this picture on, on the slide? This surface here is the location of the pre-shock. This is where we have a cusp forming, a C1 third cusp. Out of this cusp, the shock will emerge. Now, the initial data specified here travels along lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, and it carries with it information from the initial data, meaning the data at the end of the formation process, all the way to the shock. So these three different wave families being slower than the shock, they will carry with them information from the data to the shock. So in fact, they will determine the, the, the Z minus, uh, sorry, Z minus, K minus, and W minus on the shock. In addition, there is one more characteristic family, lambda three, which is faster than the shock, it's supersonic. And this one will carry information about W plus up to the shock. So what does that mean? That initially, the rankin hugino jump conditions had seven unknowns and three equations. But I've just told you that because of um, determinism, and by that, I just mean the lax geometric entropy conditions, four fields are known on the shock, namely one, two, three, four. And hence, all of a sudden, we have a perfectly well-defined system and we are off to the races. There's no undetermined uh, anything. Everything is specified. Now, those three conditions are used in the following way. One of the conditions is used to evolve the shock. So S dot is equal to. What are the other two conditions used for? To compute the two fields, the jumps in the two fields. What is the role of the entropy condition? The entropy condition selects the correct root of the sixth order coupled polynomials. What is the main result? I'm drawing here the fields W, A, K, and Z. You start with K and Z zero, A is smooth, and W has a very negative slope. This object evolves. And at some finite time, it forms a first singularity, a cusp. At that time, K and Z remain zero. A itself, its gradient does not blow up. However, its derivative, which is actually the vorticity, uh, develops a one third cusp. Now from this pre-shock, shock development ensues, and shock development ensues and produces not just the shock, but also a weak contact and weak rarefaction, which are the weak singularities that Landau and Lifshitz were alluding to. And this is how they look like. So immediately after the shock, after the shock, the field Z jumps down, entropy jumps up, like we have specified. The dominant Riemann variable also jumps. We know exactly by how much they jump. And the field A, which is the radial velocity, does not jump. However, if you look at the derivative, that jumps, the vorticity jumps. In addition, at, along these weak singularities, certain cusps are forming, C one half cusps. And these are one half one-sided cusps that we can fully classify in, in our theorem. Now, what is the main result going back to, to the Euler? The main result is if you start with smooth data, generically meaning in a stable way, the first singularity you will see is a C1 third cusp in angular velocity and a C1 one third cusp in uh, vorticity, essentially. Then immediately after an entropy producing shock wave emerges. And moreover, and this is the main point of, that I, I'm not sure I'm gonna get to, it's unique. The fields jump with precise power laws. Along the blue curve, a weak contact emerges. And along the green curve, a weak rarefaction emerges. This result is new even in one dimension. I'm sorry that I'm rushing, but uh, I'm out of time. It shows that the Onsager type criterion for entropy production compressed by Euler is sharp. So it produces the other side of the Onsager conjecture. And most importantly, and this is unfortunately the part I'm not gonna to get to emphasize, we get uniqueness. 
And the uniqueness is because we have started with smooth data. Starting with smooth data tells you precisely the generic pre-shock. And the generic pre-shock tells you correctly and precisely the functional space in which you should study your evolution after the pre-shock. And this is the functional space. And again, I'm, I'm having to rush through it. This is the space, which is the only space that you will generically land in if you start from smooth data, develop a singularity and develop the shock. And you have uniqueness in this space. So this is in contrast to the results obtained by Delelis and Sekelihidi for the Riemann problem, in which if you start with Riemann problem, you can use the convex integration method to get infinitely many solutions. But what we're saying here is please do not start with the Riemann problem. The shock doesn't just form all of a sudden, it comes from a smooth data. And in that setting, here's a setup in which you have uniqueness. And uh, I don't have any more time to discuss the proof. So I want to thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you Vlad for uh, this exciting talk with a fresh new, uh, fresh view on, on multidimensional uh, conservation laws. I think we're out of time. Uh, I'm uh, looking here at the chat whether there are some some questions. Uh, I think we have to uh, we have to uh, we have to stop here. But I'm sure uh, there are other occasions to ask uh, to ask questions. So thank you very much, and thanks uh, uh, thanks to the audience for uh, for joining. And hope you stick around to the PDE session. See you later. Thank you.